quieter place, maybe. Oh, that's that's okay. Hi, um, we are on all noisy. now <laughs> with Mazen. Okay. We're going to be talking about Gaza, about the village in the West Bank that's facing imminent demolition, and a lot more about Palestine. So Mazen, could you begin by just telling us uh, where you are right now and just a little bit about yourself first? So my name is Mazen Kumsi. I'm Palestinian uh, American who lives in the West Bank, and um, I teach at Bethlehem University. And now I am at the boat called Al Auda, which is a boat that is intended to go to Gaza, God willing. Uh, and uh, we have come from Napoli yesterday at, after 24-hour dry uh, ride from Napoli. And this is the last leg of this tour before Gaza. Wow. And um, could you tell us a little bit about yourself as well? I know you're based in Bethlehem. Um, so just a little bit of background. So I am a, a you know, professor in biology, and I am also director of a new museum that we founded at Bethlehem University called Palestine Museum of Natural History and Palestine Institute for Biodiversity and Sustainability. And they are institutes intended to strengthen Palestinian resilience, resistance, or as we call it, sumud on the land. Great. So speaking of resilience and resistance and sumud on the land, as well as sustainability, uh, we at Code Pink, we've been following the impending demolition of the Bedouin village. Um, and I know that there is a ecological or ecologically built school there. Um, I'm wondering, and I know also that you have been to this village recently. So I'm wondering if you can just tell us a little bit about uh, what's going on there. So Khan al Ahmar is the name of the town there. Uh, is a community of about 200 Palestinians who were ethnically cleansed from the Negev area and moved to that area in 1950s um, after also being denied access to the Jordan Valley. So they went up the hills and they live in the hills that are to the east of Jerusalem or between Jerusalem and Jericho. And uh, Israel has been building settlements throughout the area of the West Bank, as you know, over 230 colonies that are built in the West Bank now uh, that house nearly 800,000 Jewish Israelis, and they are expanding every day. And so the idea uh, is this is part of the same process, colonization, removal of the native people from their land. So they want to remove these communities and this community is very resilient, as you pointed out. They also are ecologically sensitive. They built a school, for example, from uh, rubber tires and mud. And, uh, and uh, 174 uh, children go to the school, uh, not only from that community, but from around uh, the community surrounding uh, Bedouin communities. Uh, I saw that you were there recently, and I know that there have been a lot of protests there by the community um, and by activists from both from the area and from around the world. Could you talk a little bit about what it was like to be there and what you experienced? Yes, I was there last week, and it is really heartbreaking to see the uh, beautiful uh, community that was, uh, you know, there for. Uh, you know, 60 years, 65 years plus, and how, you know, the potentiality of it being removed. Uh, Israel just uh, actually bulldozed their, their street and they uh, erected a barricade uh, just a couple of days ago uh, in preparation for ethnically cleansing the village. Under pressure from international community, 
another the Israeli court uh, delayed uh, the uh, eviction by a few weeks, I think till 16 August, uh, pending getting all the information, so to speak, from the government. The government is uh, moving forward with plans for the demolition and uh, plans for the relocation of the, the community. And they want to put them in, a, in a, basically a garbage dump site, uh, which is not suitable for living, let alone making a living. Um, basically, uh, these are Bedouins that rely on uh, herding sheep and goat, uh, goats, and they will not be able to live in a, uh, without access to, uh, to land that their sheep and goats can live off of. Do you have any hope that uh, the Israeli courts and that the pressure will be successful? Or, yeah, what, what are your thoughts on going forward? Um, I think the only hope for saving Khan al-Ahmar as any other Palestinian community is if the international community moves. And what we are seeing now from the international community is very disappointing. I mean, of course, the resistance is very important and the refusal to move is very important. But after all, we are talking about the fifth strongest army in the world against unarmed civilians. So obviously, when they choose to move and evict them, they will uh, be able to remove them. Uh, doesn't mean that the locals will accept this and many times they will rebuild. We remember the village of Al Arakib in the Negev, which was demolished 132 times, and each time the villagers rebuilt that village. So there is an element of local resistance and rebuilding. There's the element of the international community. International community, unfortunately, uh, under the current geopolitical structures with the world, with the Trump in office, Netanyahu in office, and also, I am sorry to say, Abu Mazen in office, a Palestinian president whose term has expired and who was not doing a whole lot to protect his people. I think uh, we are in for some rough waters, as we say here in the Mediterranean. So, uh, speaking of water, you are right now with the Gaza Freedom Flotilla. And we're waiting to see if uh, Anne Wright, who is, I think most of our watchers know at Code Pink, she's part of Code Pink and um, part of the Freedom Flotilla. We're waiting to see if she can join us as well. Um, and, and she's there as well, but off somewhere at the moment. Uh, could you tell us a bit about the Freedom Flotilla and uh, what you're doing there specifically? So the Freedom uh, Flotilla is this particular Freedom Flotilla is made up of four ships. This ship that I'm on is that's called Al Auda is is, is a engine ship, but the other three ships are sailing boat ships, and they uh, they intend to sail to Gaza as part of the repeated attempts to highlight the blockade on Gaza and break it. Now to break this blockade is not easy. We know that there were dozens of attempts literally to break the siege in Gaza, the blockade, and um, five ships uh, did manage to get through uh, in 2008 and 2009. Uh, but since then, in the past nine years, Israel has basically acted in its pirate capacity, hijacking the ships in international water against international uh, norms and standards and international law and in, uh, in so doing Israel is uh, committing a, a crime basically a crime against humanity by hijacking ships in international water ships that pose no threat to Israeli security ships that are heading to Gaza which Israel claims that they have uh, left Gaza uh, but, of course, Israel continues to control Gaza from every entry and apply a blockade that is basically a genocidal blockade. People are literally dying in Gaza. Uh, Israel is uh, actually applying uh, poisoning the children of Gaza because the Gaza Strip has entitlement to water according to international law. 
but Israel let uh, let no water into Gaza, and so Gaza is relying on the aquifer, and uh, the aquifer is being overdrawn and um, underneath Gaza, basically. And 97% of the aquifer water is not suitable for drinking, yet people drink it, and it's basically poisoning one million Gaza children today, as we speak, are being poisoned by drinking unsuitable water, thanks to the Israeli blockade and Israeli deprivation of Gaza from uh, of its water, of its rightful ownership of water, uh, and uh, and of uh, of any means of livelihood. It's basically a genocide. I hate to use this term, but it is a slow genocide of the people of Gaza. So it's a slow genocide every day from water that isn't fit for drinking, uh, sewage, and, and all of the devastation from the blockade. And then this past week, we are, are watching uh, massacres. And actually, we've been watching massacres since uh, March 30th. This, this past week, we are watching massacres by bombs um, prior to this. And we're still also watching massacres by sniper. Uh, could you talk a little bit about this and, and what it's like for you as a Palestinian uh, living in Bethlehem, um, what the feeling is uh, in Bethlehem and the rest of the West Bank uh, for the people of Gaza and how, yeah, what, what you're, how you think anybody might be able to help? Yes, um, I mean, if we step back and think about it, it's logical that colonial powers do this. Um, colonization is not uh, unusual in human history, and the Israeli colonization is no different than the colonization by Europeans of Australia or of North America, uh, US, uh, Canada, other places. The colonizers want to create a new reality, and they want the land, but they don't want the people who come with the land. And uh, this is, uh, so they choose various methods of containing the people and of uh, uh, squeezing them, ethnically cleansing them, killing them, etc. And in the case of the Palestinians, uh, there are 13 million of us, uh, seven and a half million are refugees or displaced people, and the others are living in uh, increasingly shrinking uh, ghettos, uh, bantustans, I like to call them people warehouses because they store unwanted people in these warehouses. Gaza is, for example, a large uh, open air prison or Bantustan or a ghetto or a warehouse. And so is, by the way, Bethlehem and the other places increasingly becoming like that. Although Gaza is an advanced stage of um, Bantustanization, if you want. Uh, but it's coming to Bethlehem. Israel is building walls around Bethlehem and eventually Bethlehem and Ramallah and all these other um, islands, if you want, will become like Gaza, uh, where unwanted Palestinians are stored um, with limited access except for occasional humanitarian aid, which uh, comes from the Europeans, etc., goes through Israeli hands and Israel deducts from it whatever they want to. So basically pirating uh, humanitarian aid that is uh, coming for uh, maintaining the uh, prisoners, if you want. So, you know, the only difference between a prison and let's say Gaza is that in a prison you're forced, you're obligated to actually feed the prisoners. In this case, the prisoners are not uh, being fed by the uh, prison guards, uh, they are basically being fed by occasional uh, humanitarian aid that comes from abroad with the uh, permission of the Israeli authorities, if you want. And I hear that, uh, as you said before, that Israel is now blocking uh, more and more of that humanitarian aid. I saw on uh, Sunday that two teenagers were uh, killed by by a bomb in Gaza, dropped by Israel. And I have been reading from Netanyahu that this is in response to flaming kites. Could you give your thoughts on the disproportionality? 
Well, uh, Israel, uh, since I came back from the United States in 2008, Israel has uh, continued to attack Gaza with three main peaks that happened in 2008, 2012, 2014. Were, and now, of course, so that's the fourth uh, you know, wave of Israeli attack on Gaza. Israel uses these attacks uh, as uh, basically weapons testing uh, facility feed, you know, laboratory, basically. They test Israeli new weapons every two to four years on Gaza. Uh, like shooting ducks in a barrel, basically. It's uh, very simple. Um, and Israel, I mean, there is plenty of videos that demonstrate that these uh, people in Gaza are not posing any threat to Israeli soldiers or anybody. Um, that Israel is shooting them uh, in the back sometimes, shooting paramedics like 21-year-old Razan Najjar, who was tending to injured people, was shot. Uh, even uh, killing, uh, you know, um, press people, journalists, uh, children as young as uh, 11 and 12 years old shot in the back. Uh, so clearly that's what they do with people demonstrating near the borders. But then occasionally also Israel drops bombs on Gaza, as they did this past Saturday, and they continued, started this past Saturday, and they continued in the last few days. And Saturday, for example, they dropped the bombs on the, uh, on basically an open park, killing two children, uh, 15 and 16 years old, who were just playing there. Uh, they were just simply at the wrong place at the wrong time. And so, and, and it's heartbreaking to watch, uh, you know, see the picture of these uh, two lifelong buddies who their last post on Facebook was a picture of themselves, selfie basically with a heart between them, saying, you know, friends for life. And they were just butchered uh, for uh, obviously just simply as I said, it's uh, Israel wants a land. They don't want the people who come with the land. So the Palestinians are dehumanized. And of course, Israel can use any excuse that they want to kill Palestinians, uh, just like the European colonizers in the United States used many excuses to kill natives and even hunt them and give rewards for people who kill them. So, uh as you're there on the Gaza Freedom Flotilla, and if folks are wondering why Mazen's image has been moving back and forth a little bit, it's because he's on the boat, on the water. Um, what would you advise us, all of us who care so much about what's happening in Gaza and um, in the West Bank and throughout Palestine, do you have any suggestions for what we can do? Well, uh... We, uh, this movement for free Palestine is a global movement. The Palestinian struggle is not a local struggle. It impacts everybody. After all, especially in the U.S. where our tax money, and I say our because I'm also a U.S. citizen, our tax money is going to fund this killing, this massacre of Palestinians and the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians from their land. It is our responsibility as human beings, first of all, to each other, because we should not be thinking as Palestinians, we should be thinking uh, as, uh, or as Americans for that matter, we should be thinking as people, as human beings. There is one race, which is a human race. And I think we need to think like that, just like we affected change in South Africa, the boycott, divestment, sanctions, we are working uh, on the media, working on our politicians. There are many things that people can do locally. As the old saying goes, uh, think globally and act locally. So we encourage people to act locally in every sphere of their life, because this is ultimately a joint struggle for human rights, for dignity. Uh, and it, uh, it basically is a choice that we have as human beings between going down the path of endless wars, which the Zionists want us to continue down, and that's why they pushed for a war on Iraq and on Syria and other places, uh, between wars, basically, and between having peace 
and human rights that serves everybody, whether they are Jewish, Christian, Muslim, or whoever. We Palestinians have lived together, by the way. Uh, my own family is Palestinian Christian family, but my grandfather's best friend in school was Jewish. And so we have lived together in peace and harmony. We welcomed also refugees to Palestine before. Uh, for example, Armenians, uh, Circassians, Druze, people from various countries, Ethiopian Christians, and also Jews from Russia after Russian pogroms came to Palestine. We have no problem with immigrants. We do have a problem with colonization. And so we call for diversity. My background is biology, as I told you. I believe that, but diversity is strength. Whether in nature, in a forest, you know, different species living together, or in human societies, uh, diversity of beliefs and, and religions and concepts and politics and ethnicities, uh, this diversity is a form of strength, not a form of weakness. Zionism wants to eliminate diversity and create a Jewish state in the same way, in my humble opinion, as the Nazis tried to make an Aryan, white, Christian, German-speaking state, they will fail in this, as all other movements to be monolithic will fail. Uh, I am encouraged by this and encouraged by the fact we have diversity. Even on this boat, we have people from Sweden, Norway, Palestine, Israel, even we have uh, Jonathan Shapiro, and we have Zohar, Regev, you know, Israelis. So we have people of diverse backgrounds on this boat and we, uh, and we believe this is a strength. This is not a weakness. Well, we at Code Pink are with you in spirit and solidarity and our work. Um, as you are on the Freedom Flotilla, the Gaza Freedom Flotilla to break the blockade. And as you travel back to Bethlehem and continue struggling for basic human rights and freedom and equality. I want to thank you so much for talking with us and we look thank forward to much. doing so again soon. And from beautiful Palermo with the dock and the ships you can see as a beautiful country. We were welcomed by the mayor and we are welcomed by the people of this beautiful city and we hope that all cities welcome us in the same kind of spirit. Thank you. Thank you.